We want to welcome everybody here tonight, both in our live services uh, at the Sharondale Church of Christ, and also those of you who are viewing uh, on Facebook. We're thankful to have you watching with us as we study the book of 2 Corinthians. Tonight we're on chapter uh, 2, and uh, we're ready to finish out this particular chapter. And I'm going to start with verse 12, and then we'll finish this chapter 2. The Apostle Paul says this, Now when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, I still had no peace of mind, because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity, like men sent from God. You will remember, as we're going to start from the end of this chapter and move forward, you will remember that the Apostle Paul, at this church and many other places, worked with his hands as a tent maker and did not take money from the congregations that he was establishing. There were times that he did receive and accept money, for example, from the people in Macedonia who we read about here at the beginning of this. They were quite poor, the people at Philippi were, and they begged Paul to let them support him. And uh, he did receive money for them, but for the most part, he did not take wages because he didn't want it to appear that he was doing this for profit. And he said, we speak before God with sincerity. We already mentioned last week that he had to emphasize that because there were people in the Corinthian church who were criticizing him that he was not sincere. In fact, some of them even maintained that he was not really an apostle. Here it was, he started the church he would, this was his second longest ministry, and he was very close to these people. He wrote them two letters. He made them about, made three visits after he left there. And the accusation was this, that in your letters, you're very powerful. Uh, you'd step on toes. Uh, you are trying to correct things, but in your personal presence, you're weak. But that just wasn't the case. He was hoping when he made this final trip to see them that it wouldn't be to accuse them or to correct anything. And of course, we know there were a lot of things to correct in the Corinthian church. The problem with immorality, among the leadership especially, the problem with the abuse of the Lord's Supper, people showing up at church drunk, of all things. The problem of misunderstanding the resurrection. Some of them didn't even believe that there was a resurrection of the dead, even though they believed that Jesus rose from the dead, they didn't believe that Christians would. There was a problem with Christians taking their lawsuits to a secular court, and bringing reproach upon the church instead of going to brothers and sisters and have them iron it out. 
So it's problem after problem. And when the book opened, there was the problem of division, of denominationalism very early on in the Lord's church. And it wasn't because the leaders were trying to divide the church. There were some very illustrious leaders there, well-known leaders like Paul and Peter and Apollos. But the people had their favorites, and they were starting to side up with them. And then, after Paul had left to do some more missionary work, other leaders came in the church, which is a good thing. But some of them began to resent Paul, didn't want him to come around anymore. And uh, they were the ones that were accusing him of not really being an apostle. So Paul says in verse 14, Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. Jewish people, now these were predominantly Gentiles, but there were Jewish people there as well, would especially understand the fragrance or the incense because in the Old Testament religion, Incense, it was used by a special formula, and it could not be used in homes. It could not be used anywhere else. It was given by God to Moses to be used in the tabernacle and later in the temple. And in their worship, this incense was used. And uh, this aroma went up before God. But not only that, you will remember, those of you that read about the sacrifices in the Old Testament, when the sacrifices were made, they came up before God as a sweet fragrance because the people did it out of obedience. So he says in verse 15, For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. Now he's going to explain something here that is illustrated by something that was going on in Rome at this time. He says to the one, talking now about incense or fragrance, we are the smell of death. To the other, the fragrance of life. For those who accept the plan of salvation, it is a fragrance of life. To those who resent the plan of salvation, it is the smell of death. This is the illustration that, was, that Paul drawed from. In Rome, they would have victory parades in the capital, and they would honor all of the generals who would win the various wars that the Roman Empire had gone into. And not only that, they had this big parade. They had their priests that went ahead. They, it was all kinds of pomp and circumstance involved to honor these generals. And there were chariots, chariots of gold. I mean, that was absolutely beautiful, pulled by white stallions. And they also would bring the prisoners because that is part of the humiliation to bring the people that you conquered. It may be some of their generals, it more than likely was even some of their kings that they conquered. Now of course the intention was that as soon as the parade was over, the prisoners would be taken to the Circus Maximus. That's the great big auditorium that still stands in Rome. And they would be put out there for the lions, to fight with the lions and, of course, inevitably be killed. Now, one of the things that the Romans did during these triumphal entry parades, the priests would burn incense. So the incense would be a wonderful, glorious smell to those who are the victors, to the citizens of Rome, to the generals. 
But what would that fragrance be like for those who are soon to go in and be fighting with the beasts in the Circus Maximus? It would be the smell of death. I'm sure that all of us have experienced, and I know that this is kind of a minor way to illustrate it, but have you ever gotten sick on some food and the smell of it ever since just made you never want to eat another bite? That's happened with, to me on some occasions. Sometimes a fragrance, whether it's a good one or a bad one, reminds you of a horrible incident. I have, you know, the smell of roses is wonderful when you go out in the garden and smell them. But when you go into a funeral home and smell the roses, and your loved one or your friend is laying in the casket, it has an altogether different meaning, doesn't it? And I don't know how many people have told me that they do not like roses because the smell reminds them of death. Well, that's what he's talking about here. For the non-Christian, the aroma to them who are perishing is the smell of death. But the aroma to those who are being saved is the smell of life. In chapter 3, the Apostle Paul asks a question as he opens the chapter. And I'm going to read just a small portion of it. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Now, Paul did not want to have to defend himself. And it looks like that's what he's doing here. Commend ourselves again sounds like bragging rights. He said, are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? It was a practice in the early church that if you were a Christian and went to another city, that you would bring with you letters of recommendation that you were indeed a Christian in good standing with the fellowship from which you came. Some churches still practice that. There are some denominations that you absolutely have to have a letter proving that that person was a member of the former congregation. It's not so much practiced anymore, but it was a practice of the early church. And so he said, do we need letters of recommendation from you? You know, in other words, I started the church. I'm an apostle. And he goes on to say, not only that, you are the living proof of what I am. You yourselves are our letter. Now, the King James uses the word epistle. Now, epistle is just what I'm reading here. It's a letter from one of the Christians, like Paul or Peter or James and John and all the rest. It's a letter and it's on paper and ink. It was originally written on papyrus, but here for us it's on paper and ink. But he says, you are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. In other words, they were living epistles. And that's what you and I are. There are many people that do not read the Bible. And when we practice what's written in these epistles, then we become living epistles for people who are not yet Christians. He said, you show that you are a letter from Christ. Isn't that a beautiful expression? You are a letter from Christ. People who are not yet Christians would like to know that God loves them. They'd like to know that they can go to heaven. They'd like to know that they can be forgiven. They'd like to know that there's some peace of mind that they can have in this life. And we are that letter. If we happen to share with them what's written in the letter. 
So he says, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. That's who wrote the Bible. The Spirit of God wrote the Bible. The, the scriptures themselves tell us that those who wrote the Bible were moved by the Holy Spirit to write these words. Not on tablets of stone. Now you'll remember the reference he's going to make in a moment, which I'm not going to get into tonight, is about Moses receiving the Ten Commandments, and that's why he uses this statement, not on tablets of stone. Back in the Old Testament, when Moses received the law for the first time, it was written in stone. But he said, yours are written, are tablets of the human heart. And that's even greater. Seems more fragile, because our bodies die eventually, and the tablets of stone lasted a long time in the Old Testament as they were placed in the Ark of the Covenant for hundreds and hundreds of years. And you know, God uses a lot of fragile things to do his great work. If you go to Washington, D.C., you'll see some magnificent monuments to some of our nation's greatest leaders monuments to soldiers of the various wars. They're absolutely beautiful and they just bring tears to your eyes. Well, we know that our Lord has a monument that we celebrate every Lord's Day, a memorial, not made with stones or graphic, graphite or anything like that, but made of elements that perish, communion bread, and juice. So God can use the fragile, that which goes away, to do something eternal. Hard to believe, but he can do it. So you and I are privileged because we are the living epistles. We want to thank you for listening tonight to our message from the Word of God. And uh, I'll have a closing prayer and do want to remind you, if you wish to worship with us on Sunday mornings, our schedule is a 9.30 worship and 11 o'clock worship. You may choose either one you wish, and we hope that you choose sometime to be with us and join us for that. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for our time together tonight. I pray that you'll bless this word. And I pray that we understand it so we can apply it to our Christian lives and be better living epistles. In Jesus' name, amen.